Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. The Savannah Book Festival is honored to have you join us for our SBF at Schools event. My name is Tara Setter, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to the award-winning New York Times bestselling author, James Ponty. At the end of our time with James, you'll have a chance to ask him some questions. For the students at home, you can submit a question by clicking on the Q&A link to ask a question. For students that are in the classroom, your teacher can use the raise a hand function and we will bring you up on screen to ask your question. James was born in Italy. He grew up in Florida, just two blocks from the ocean. And during college, he worked at Walt Disney World on the Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes. His joke telling in this job helped develop him into a writer. After going to college in California, James <coughs> began writing and producing television shows for Nickelodeon, the Disney Channel, and others. James loves writing, travel, and the Boston Red Sox. He lives in Orlando, Florida with his awesome family. Thanks to a grant from the city of Savannah, you all received a copy of James' latest book, City Spies, Golden Gate. I think you're really gonna enjoy the book. Now, let's meet the man that wrote it. Please yeah. welcome James Ponty. Hello everyone, it's so nice to see you today, or not see you, to be with you in, in this strange world of, of Zooming and distancing. Um, so normally I talk about writing, but um, for the Savannah Book Festival, we wanted to have different options. So I have a talk about writing. Um, I've come with a new talk about STEM and spying. And so this, this is the first time I've given this one, so be gentle. I hope it makes sense. I hope it's good. Um, and we will get started. So first of all, though, people wonder what it's like to write spy novels. Um, I will tell you what it's like. What it, this is, this is what I think it's like, right? Or what people, it's it's glamour. So here I am with Kevin Hart and hanging out and being a celebrity and, and all this stuff. And that's what you wish it was like. This is what it looks like. It's just a little less exotic than Kevin Hart. It's more Peanuts gang and whatnot. And this is what it feels like. I'm always late. I've always have assignments to do, just like when I was in school all over again. Um, I've written a bunch of books. Um, most recently, I've been writing the City Spy series. So the first book in that series is City Spy. It's about five kids from around the world who all end up getting basically adopted by this British spy who raises them as a family of spies. And they go on missions all around the world for MI6, which is the British version of the CIA. And they go on these missions for when adults would stand out that kids might go unnoticed. The newest book is City Spies Golden Gate. And I believe this is the book that you guys got copies of. So hopefully you read this over the summer, maybe it's something in, and you enjoy it. But to give you an idea of what it's like, I made a little movie about it and you guys can see this. So here you go. Can they stop a hijacking in New York City? Break into one of the most famous libraries in the world. Outsmarting even really children and the African. These are just some of the questions that face the city spies. Five kids from around the globe. A hacker, a magician, a code breaker, a rebel, and a genius. Operating out of a secret location in the north of Scotland, they're the biggest secret in British intelligence. In their first adventure, they went to Paris to match wits with a criminal mastermind determined to release a deadly virus. Now they're back and tracking a double agent across the globe. As they travel from London to San Francisco, they have to risk it all to solve the mystery and save the day. City Spies and Golden Gate. From New York Times bestselling author, James Ponty. So that's what the book's about, but now I wanna take a look behind the book. I wanna talk about spying and why I like to write about spying. The reason I like to write about spying is I feel like that's what middle school is kind of, like that's the, that's the job we're all best at between like fifth and eighth grade because you know, really what we do at that stage in life and, and somewhat forever 
is we're like spies. I, I know when I was in 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 middle school, I would try out different identities and try to figure out, well, is this more me or is this me? And and I would study other people and try to figure out because it seemed like everyone else had the answers and I'd look for little clues and things. So that's what a kid spy is about. But but most people, when you think of spying, you have this image in your head, right? You have this famous music. So um Right, so you have this spy music. This is the, for those that don't know, this is the theme to James Bond. And we think about spies like this. We think about spies that are daring and they're, they wear tuxedos and they carry weapons and, and they're glamorous. Or like Matt Damon in the Jason Bourne movies where they're like action heroes and they're, they're always fighting and chasing and doing whatever. Or Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible movies, right? Doing these amazing acrobatics and things. And that's what we think about spies, but that's really not what spies do, right? So I do a lot of research for my books. For this most recent book that I just wrote, I actually talked to the former director of the CIA. I interviewed him. He helped me plan the mission in the next book. So this is like one of the biggest spy masters in the, in, in the world. And I asked him, I said, what's wrong with spy movies? What do you hate about spy movies and spy books? And he gave me four answers. I want to talk to you about this. So the first thing he did is he hated that in, in, in movies, the CIA can just do anything. You need to fly someone, we got a plane. You need to break into this, oh, we can break into that. That, that whatever you needed, the CIA could do it. He said, it doesn't work that way. That there's certain things they're good at and certain things that are just beyond their reach. They can't get a team somewhere in an hour when it takes five hours to get there. The next thing he hates, he hates that in movies, always the spies are wrong. You know, he says they're actually really smart people that work for the CIA and the NSA and the FBI and the MI6 and DSG and, and, and France and all. He goes, the spies are usually right. They usually, they don't tell you something unless they know that it's right usually. So he hates that. He hates that in movies, spies have no rules. There's a phrase called rogue, where these spies are just breaking the rules and I'm going to solve it my way. And he goes, that never happens. But the thing he hated most about spy books and spy movies are that, that in the real world of spying, analysts are the key, not operatives, not some guy with a gun sitting around with a hidden identity going through a back alley, as much fun as those are to write about, they write about that kind of stuff. But actually the real geniuses are in offices, looking at information or figuring things out. And a lot of them use STEM, a lot of them use science and technology and engineering and math. They use these things. So I wanna talk a little bit about how STEM works in spying. So let's start with math, right? So perhaps the most key thing of a spy is how to communicate in code. And the most basic code is a math code, right? Every letter has a number and that number indicates that letter. So if you look here, one through 26, is, one through 26 is, is one for each letter. So if I were to use this code and send you a message, it said eight, five, 12, 12, 15, you would look at eights under the H and fives under the E and the two 12s under L and oh wait, I know what, that spells hello. Okay, very basic, but that's a code. And if you can understand that, you can understand that math is a part of codes and the more complex the math, the more complex the code, because this eventually people can figure out, you know, maybe not your friends in the cafeteria or something like that, but people, so the codes that the, the codes that they use now look more like this. This is a spy code for a translation and it's all about prime numbers and integers and equations and whatever. And it's not so easy as to say, well, a equals one and E equals five and J equals 10. Because you need to make it up. But more, even this stuff can be broken. So in World War II, there was this thing called the Enigma machine. And the Enigma machine, we talk about all the weapons in the war. And there's so many key weapons and battleships and airplanes and bombers and all this stuff. Perhaps no invention was more important. No bit of technology was more important than the Enigma machine. And the Enigma machine was the code machine used by the German 
and axes used by the Germans, not the other axis forces, to send secret messages. And it would frustrate the enemy because they could hear the message, it'd come over the radio, numbers or whatever, they could intercept it and they couldn't make sense of it. And I'll tell you why, because unlike the code I just showed you where one equals A and, and five equals E, the Enigma machine worked this way. You see the keys right there. There were keys and this thing down off to the left with the letters, those would light up when you press a key. Like if you press the H, a letter would light up, but it wouldn't be the H, it would be a different letter. And, and you see in the back, those dials, those are called rotors. So what happened is if you press the letter A on a keyboard, it would trigger something in the plug board and that A would become an M. You could follow the line around and the M would go into the rotors and then it would become a B and the B would become a J and the J would become an F and the F would become a P and an N and an X and an O and then back in here and then it would turn into an H and the H would light up and it would happen instantly. So you could type the letters and, and then you'd write that down. And what was important was there was a machine just like this from the person who's receiving it. And they would type the letters that they got and the real letters would pop up. And there are so many variations and every day the rotors would change. And so they didn't, so what happened is at a place called Bletchley Park, and this is, these are pictures I took when I researched. Cause like I said, I researched, I went to Bletchley Park in England and hut 11A was this hut where um, mostly women and mathematicians we're trying to figure out how to do this code. And it would start every day at midnight and a new code would start. And this machine to the right is called a bomb, but it's spelled like bomb with an E at the end. And all these rotors, and they would work out every different variation. And they would spend 24 hours trying to come up with figure out if they could break the code and they would get close and then it'd be midnight and it would start all over again. And it took years to happen. And I like to point that out because it was heroic what all the soldiers were doing. There's no doubt about it. But a key part of this war was being fought by people who were really good at math and women who you wouldn't even think of as going into war. And, and it was funny, the way that they were found was um, they did anything to find people who were good at math and puzzles. There was at one point, the new, biggest newspaper in London had a contest for or they, they had, if you're good at crossword puzzles. And they had all these people come in and take a crossword puzzle. And everyone who finished the crossword puzzle in a certain amount of time was pulled over to the side and said, hey, um, we have this thing that you might want to try to do. And they got to help work in the war. And the most amazing part of that to me, absolutely, not only that they solved this thing, it was so top secret, they were not allowed to tell their families. And they were not allowed to tell their families for over 40 years. It was such a secret. No one wanted to know how they fit. And when they solved it in this room, in 11A, they solved it. That, in, that, that shortened the war, they think, by at least two years, by the fact that they could now read the messages. This is all math. No one's pulling a trigger. No one's doing this. This is all math, and it's saving millions of lives. On this tour, in this room, the guy told me that was doing the tour guide. He said the most amazing thing happened. He was taking this family through the tour, or this group, like 15 people. And there was this old woman who was probably in her late 70s or 80s. And she's standing there and she looked at it. And she said, it's wrong. And the guy said, what? She goes, you have your cables. There's another spot where there's all these plugs. He goes, your, your plugs are arranged wrong. And he goes, how do you know? And she looked around because she'd never told anyone this. It was over 40 years after the war. She goes, because I worked in this room and I know what it was like. And her husband was standing right next to her. And her husband goes, you worked at Bletchley Park in Hut 11 or whatever hut it was? And she goes, yes, dear, I'm sorry. I never told you that. This is the, the tour guide is telling me, this is amazing. And the man said, I worked in Hut 22. And she goes, what? And they both worked there. And this was the greatest secret of their life. And they lived together for 40 years, always wishing they could tell the other. But because they had promised the government they would never tell, they hadn't told. And they found out in this room on the tour toward the end of their life. Amazing. So that's a math thing. But then there's science. There's great science. And I'm going to show you now pictures of things that are actual gadgets made by the CEIA and other groups. These are all pictures from the International Spy Museum. If you go to Washington, it is so much fun to go to. So this is a shoe transmitter. 
And this was because there was, I forget which country it was, the guys didn't like buying the clothes in like Bulgaria or wherever they were. So they would order their clothes from England and the Bulgarians would break into the mail and they would open up the shoes and they would put microphones into the shoes. So then the guys, when they would wear them, they could listen in on the spies all because they liked their clothes a certain way. So that's science. This was a special camera they built that could hook onto pigeons and that the pigeons could fly over and do the spying for them. Realize a lot of this stuff is before the internet and before, before smartphones and phones that took pictures and hid things. And you're looking for ways to gather information or to pass codes. This is a thing built in the 90s. This is like it was supposed to be an insect that had a camera and the Russians built this so it could fly around. So you could be in a meeting at a CIA headquarters and there'd just be a bug flying around, but it would actually be a camera with a microphone and be listening in. And they really built this. And I don't think this one ever really worked well. I don't think it ever became operational. So the dead rat. Then the other thing is you want to pass secrets, right? So this is the hard thing. So if you're an undercover agent for America working in Moscow and you're spying on the Russians and you find out a bit of information, you can't go up to an American and hand it to them because the, you're probably being looked at, you could get caught. So they had all these ways to hide things. And one of them was dead rats. The CIA had all these dead rats brought in. And what they would do is they would find out the color of rats in a different city and they would dye them using makeup and hair coloring from like Clairol or something. They have all the special hair color. So they had different colors for different cities. And, but the, the, the rats would be real dead rats, but they would be emptied out and you could hide the message in the rat. And the reason they picked the rat is no one's gonna pick one up. No one's gonna pick one up to do it, but even more gross than rats and rats are pretty gross. They developed for some parts of Asia, tiger poop, but it's not really tiger poop, but it looks like tiger poop and it has a transmitter inside it and it sends messages and they would leave the tiger poop in a place that it would be transmitting this beacon of a message. And so the Americans or whoever would know, oh, I just go to there and no one's picking up tiger poop, right? So you think about, yeah, it's really neat to see um, Sean Connery in a car that turns into a boat or that you see, you know, um, Jason Bourne doing all of this um, karate and martial arts and Krav Maga and like that. But a lot of spying is tiger poop. And it's that kind of stuff. And it is, the, the, the reason that that's kind of neat, the reason that's kind of fun is you might like the idea of this stuff, but think, oh, I, I don't, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to use a gun. I'm not going to, I can't slip into that. But there's so many different people who come together. And what this guy who was the director of the CIA told me, it is these people, it is the analyst. He goes, there's never been a piece of information that an operative has gotten that has swung, it, swung things dramatically. It's all important. But that the real dramatic stuff happens when five pieces of information come to someone who's at a desk or at a computer somewhere trying to figure out how do these things connect. And then when you see the connection, like all those rotors going in the Enigma machine, then the answer lights up like a button. And that means there's place in espionage for anyone that is into any of the science and technology. Um, oh, there's even weapons. So this was a lipstick pencil. This was for an East German woman agent and she would pull it out like she was gonna put on her lipstick, but you see the little hole at the end and rather than putting a lipstick, it would shoot a single bullet. It's really fancy, it goes back to Tiger Poop. And this was an umbrella that actually sprayed poison out the tip. So I think it was used probably like in London where it's always raining, people have umbrellas. And I think it was, this was made, I think by the Romanians and the Bulgarians and they could walk through and, and they get close. They, this was actually, this one was specifically made to kill one person in particular and they would use that. And even still, and it's really sad that this stuff goes on still. There is in Russia, there is a leader that they wanted this, dead and they poisoned his underwear. This was like last month. Like this is still going on today. And it's science and technology in espionage. And so I get to write about it in my books. The first books I wrote were about zombies. Um, and that was a real fun book series to write. Then the next books I wrote were about, were mysteries um, about these kids who were detectives that worked for the FBI. And that was kind of my 
intro into a little bit of spy stuff because the FBI doesn't spy like the CIA does, but they collect information and they have to know this and, and all this stuff. And then um, this picture. So let me tell you about this picture. So this picture was taken in London. My wife and I and my son in London. I had just finished writing this book, a book called Vanished, and I turned it into my editor, sent it on like this very computer I'm on right now, typed it up, attached it to an email, and sent it. And then that was five o'clock at night. Eight o'clock that night, my wife and I were on a plane to London because our son was going to school in England that year, and we wanted to visit him. And my wife had never been to Europe, but she really wanted to go. And so on her spring break, she's a school teacher, we flew to London for the week, for London and Paris. And this was 24 hours after I finished writing that book. And so I'm sitting there. And when you're a writer, you're always trying to think of new stories. You're always trying to think of new plots. And so I was there in London at Buckingham Palace. And I thought, what a great place to set a story. And I started thinking about, well, what kind of story would be here? I could, I could maybe have my characters from Frame come to London in one of the books. That would be fun. But then a couple of days later, we were in Paris. And we were in Paris, and we we're having such a good time. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want my characters to go to London and Paris. Maybe I come up with a new series that goes to those countries, right? That goes to those cities. And I started trying to think of what would it be. And I always liked writing about, I always liked watching spy movies. I always liked reading spy books. That maybe I could write a spy book, a book where they go to places like Paris. And this book, you can look at the cover, almost the same, became this picture became this book. And the next year we went to San Francisco. And it was so much fun. And this became the book that you guys have, right? And so I write this, this these books about these characters. Um, and I wanted kids from around the world. But I wanted a lot of them. I wanted five kids in the spy team. Because, you know, that, that seems like James Bond's a loner. But like the Mission Impossible team, they have like four or five people usually. And it's like, I really like that. But I wanted all the kids to be important, not just one main and then four supporting characters. And I thought, well, it might be hard to keep track of them in your head when you're reading it. So what I need to do is I need to come up with a system to make it easier to follow. And what I did is I decided if I named the, sp the spies are from all over the world, and I named the spies, their code names are the cities that they're from, then what they can do is when you're reading it, you instantly know if you read Paris, that's the boy from France. If you read Sydney, that's the girl from Australia. So it's easier to keep track. So these are the characters who are the main characters in City Spies. <laughs> So those are the city spies. And what I did is I, I, I started with a list of cities that sounded like they were good names. And I picked one from each continent. And so we have Brooklyn. So Brooklyn is my computer hacker. We have Paris. Paris is actually from Africa, but he's recruited in France. So he goes by Paris. And he's my genius. He's a chess wizard and, and really great. There's Sydney. And Sydney is a... Um, real rebel she's very much into the righteousness she's from australia rio is from south america um he was a street performer magician and his magic skills really come into play we talked about math and, and engineering and science early on the cia hired one of harry houdini harry houdini's most famous magician of all time hired one of harry houdini's ma magician friends to teach magic at the cia because all the tricks that are used to do magic tricks 
all the skills are perfect for hiding messages, sneaking things, making things seem to be disappeared when they're really so in your pocket or in your hand. And so he's my magician. And then the last one was Kat. Kat's from Katmandu in Nepal. She goes by Kat and she is, um, she's all that math stuff we did at the beginning. She's a math wizard and she sees the world in numbers. And so she breaks codes. And those are the city spies. And I am James and I am your writer here to talk to you. So um, that went a little quick because I know Mr. Newsom said that his kids had to leave early. So I tried to pick up the pace since that was a lot of it. But um, I can answer questions about anything that you guys might be interested in. And if you're not, that's all right. Um, but it, does anyone have any questions? And, well, and, and I, maybe what it may, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. A, hey, um, I did open it up for the, the students to email me. And I actually got a fifth grade class to jump in. Okay. And, okay. Uh, they're, uh, they're really, they, they liked the video and the, uh, the, the, the uh, Zoom so far. And okay. uh, I'm waiting for some questions for if they have some. But I did want to tie in like the, the engineering piece. Everybody's a problem solver. And, and engineers, that's that I, during STEM, I teach about engineers being problem solvers. And that's what the CIA does too. I mean, even all your examples, they're all trying to solve a problem. They're all trying to, to get down and, and fix whatever's broken. And uh, I mean, it, what you did is, is amazing, sir. And I just, <laughs> I, I've, I had the privilege to go to the International Spy Museum and I'm sure that you took a lot of uh, ideas and and there's a lot you could probably talk about more about the International Spy Museum in Washington DC but um, I just everything you've been talking about has has definitely been able to to uh, my gears are turning basically okay, okay. <laughs> so thank you so much oh uh, sure no, and, and, and you know it's um you, you mentioned engineering solved problems books are actually about problems the, 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 that's the thing that people lose people think they're Oh, it's a plot. Oh, it's a this. It's a, well, that it is. But really what books are about, books are about problems. And, you know, the character has a problem and they try to solve it. And they sometimes problems present themselves in a way where an engineering development invention or technology is the solution. How do I solve this? But some problems are less defined and they're more, we've got to figure that out as people with our personal skills. But we put those together the same way as we put, we engineer things or we do math on things. You know, we, we, we all look at the world a different way. And it's through those lines that we figure out the solution. You know, so I'm actually was a terrible reader growing up. I, I, I struggled with reading. I was a really good math student. And even today, even though I write books for a living, I use math all the time when I'm writing. Um, and by that, I'll mean, I'll use concepts of math like absolute value where negative four equals four. That actually it works for characters too. So like someone who is a lot of something or not of something are really from a story standpoint the same because they're different from the middle person who's some of something, right? That did not make sense the way I said it, but it makes sense to my head and that's the problem is some of these of these ideas make sense in my head, but I can't say them in anything shorter than this. The answer is this long. Like I can explain it to you in this many pages. And so um, we write about problems in middle grade books. So middle grade books are these kinds of books. The books we're talking about today, the books you read in middle school, or you know, to be honest, a lot of adults read these books. I get I get mail from adults all the time. They always start the same way. Like they feel guilty. Like. Um, I'm 40 years old, but I love this book. You know, I'm a grandma and I read it with my grandson and then he went home and I kept reading because I couldn't stop. And all the people that write these books, you know, a lot of them are friends of mine. If, if you're a reader and you like Gordon Corman or Stuart Gibbs or Max Brellier, who writes Last Kids and Earth, those are all my buddies. We get together every week on Zoom. And, and we get together and we talk about things and all of us have the same thing. All of us kind of struggled our way through middle school. Kind of like, not necessarily with the school part, although sometimes the school part, but with the people part. Like, you know, 
why does everyone seem to have the answer and I don't have the answer? Or everyone's cool and I'm not cool. Or everyone is good at this and I'm not good at it. Or everyone has a new, you know, we didn't have phones growing up, but like I'm sure it's like everyone has good phone or good shoes or good this. And, I'm not, and what, we, what, what you find out is we all had that. We all had that about different things because usually the things that you're good at, you just ignore because you think everyone's good at them. But the things that you struggle with, you don't. And we, we talk about that our books in a lot of way are they're filled with jokes and action and adventure and stuff, but they're really kind of like secret maps that how to make it through middle school. Like, you know, these characters are trying to solve the problems. And in the, in the frame books, those problems are what it means to be a friend. In the City Spice books, those problems are what is the real definition of a family? Because we have these kids who all come from different places and different parents, but they are a family. And then sometimes it's technology and then sometimes it's that and sometimes it's all of those things and the beautiful thing and the reason why i wanted five characters and you got to get a little taste of them is they're all good at different things and so they all bring a different attitude of solution to the problem um do, does anyone from the savannah book festival have a question they want to ask yeah i have one what kind uh, of research do you do for your books i do a ton of research yeah i i try to go to all the places in the book the newest book that i just now am writing which is this book right here so now it's just a notebook and paper off my printer it is a um set in moscow and beijing and i have never been to those and because of covid i had no way to go to those so that's the first time i've ever done that for a book so i try to go to a place and when i go i take tons of pictures like the picture i showed a couple of pictures yeah from Bletchley Park. I take pictures because I want to remember things and I want to be able to describe them well. So like when I'm writing a chapter, so like there is a chapter in um, City Spies where they're in the, the train station and the airport in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I walked all through those for an hour at least each. And I took a picture of every different thing because I wanted to be able to describe things. I don't want to describe it like, the train station is 175 meters long and it's got a, you know, no, not like that, but it's like, okay, they're walking. What are they seeing when they're walking? And so I'll, on my computer, I'll have my document here and next to it, I'll have the pictures. And I'll go, oh, wait, there's that place where you can buy those little meat sandwiches. Okay, that's what a 12 year old wants. He's hungry. He's just written on the, so it's like, so we're going to, we're going to, and now I can describe it. And even to the point, I can expand it and I can see which ones they sell. Or I can go to the train station or the, uh, the airport. How much does it cost to take the bus into town? Or how much, and I have, all, or where would you hide? And when I go, I try to think about that. Where would you hide? Now, sometimes I don't get to go places. So um, City Spice 2 starts out on a marine research vessel, more science. So this is a, a it's a marine research vessel that's traveling through the North Sea, studying everything from whales to whatever, but it's, Everyone on board is a, a is a, a girl and in middle school, except for the crew and, and scientists. And it's based on the idea of coding camps that they have here for coding for girls. And and it gets kidnapped. And then my two spies on it gets hijacked, have to spoil the hijacking. Um, okay. I called and tracked down the biggest, most elite marine research vessel in America. And I, I explained who I was. And they said, sure, we'll help you. And so this woman got on the phone with me. And I, so I asked a lot of basic questions, you know, what do you call this and that and this and that? And, and where do you sleep and how crowded is it? And how, how what does it smell like? You know, I want to know that thing. What does it smell like? What does it, what does it look like? But then after I got her on and I knew we, I, I had the basic information. So, All right, these next questions are going to be, you're going to maybe regret being on this phone call. <laughs> I was like, what would happen if someone hijacked the boat? You know, she said, and what? And I go, all right, well, you know, it's a spy thing. So if someone hijacked the boat, how would you, how would you tell people? And she said, well, there's like three ways to send an emergency message off the ship. And okay, and so she told me those ways. So then I wrote those down and for different situations. And then I said, okay, imagine someone's hijacked the ship. Where would you hide? I want the two best hiding places on the ship. And then she said the greatest thing. She goes, I know the answer to that. And I go, what? She goes, when the ships come in, we have to pilot them to San Diego. 
And so it's just a small crew. We're not doing research. We're just piloting the ship. So we play this ultimate game of hide and seek. And she goes, the best, and she, she told me the two best places to hide. So my character said, so you do that kind of research. I told you earlier, I ended up, the, the CIA, the, the high ranking guy at the CIA, his wife's a school librarian. She likes my books and she put us together. And I asked him, I asked him, what do you hate about spy books? But I also said, here's what I want to have happen in the, in the story. How would you do it? And he told me. And then when I was writing one of the frame books takes place in the Library of Congress. I just wrote them and they took me behind the scenes. They let me hold Thomas Jefferson's books. And, 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 and at one point I'm like, why are, you, why are you helping me so much? And it's always the same, whether it's from the CIA, whether it's from the Marine Research Vessel, whether it's Library of Congress, it's like, we want you to get it right. We care about kids. We want kids to know what it really is because these are amazing things. So I hope if you read about the Library of Congress in the book, you, you like the adventure and you like the excitement, you try to solve the mystery. But I also hope you think, that's a pretty neat place. If I ever go to Washington, I wanna go there. Or, wow, I didn't know we had re research vessels that went out to sea and did this, or the C, you know the CIA being tired of everyone doing you know martial arts and guns when a lot of it is computers, and so it's people wanting to set the record straight. People want their story to be told, and that's really the great thing about writing is you get to tell your story and you get to tell other people's stories, which is really fun. Okay, I have a question from Charles James. And okay, he Charles wants to know, do you make, write sports books or just spy books? Um, I do not write sports books. Um, I used to write for Sports Illustrated for kids and I worked for 15 years for NBC Sports. So I made sports documentaries. But, um, so I love sports. Um, if you see in the background, I've got like Jackie Robinson, I got a Lou Gehrig baseball card, I got, it, it, sports are great. Um, but I don't typically write them, but often they're part of the story. So the frame series, it's a big part of the story. Is that one of the one of the characters is a really good soccer player? Oh, okay. okay. Is being so an I author think, oh, is being an author lonely. Is being an author lonely? Writing can be lonely, but you need to be alone to do it. You can't write and talk. You can't, you know, despite what people tell you, you shouldn't write, listen to music or TV. Yeah, you, know, you need to have sound. So the problem is you need to offset that. Yeah. Now I have an editor, I have a publisher, I have an agent, I have all of these people who work on the books. So I can call and talk to them. But I have a group of about 20 friends who are writers that are all really good. And I can call them or I can text them. I can say, I'm having a problem. Can you, how would you do this? Or I can just say, you know, we do, like I said, we get together every Tuesday night and we just talk and goof off and talk about the books we're writing. And if someone's won an award, we always congratulate each other. And so we make it feel like we're not working alone, even though we do the work alone. And then I get to do this. I get to come and I get to visit schools. Next year, hopefully I'll be back to visiting in person. And it is so much fun to actually get to talk to kids, young readers, teachers, old readers, and find out what it is about books that gets them excited. And that then helps me when I'm alone. I don't feel alone. I feel like those people are with me telling me, and I remember, oh, they really like this. I want to have this. I want to write this. So. Okay. I have a few more questions or if you want to hear them or do you? Well, I don't I, I know. I know our site. We're down to just a few people. So I don't want to, I don't want to hold Charles and, and Mr. Newsom hostage. <laughs> um, I don't know. So we can, we can do a couple more if you want and, and then just wrap it there. Cause also, if you want to be able to use the recordings in class, usually they should probably be about 40 in here or 45 minutes. It's hard to fit in a class schedule. So you want, you have one or two more you want to throw? That's great. Do you ever wish you could go back and change parts of your book? Rarely. Um, I sometimes do though. I sometimes reread something and I think, gosh, if you would have, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting better all the time. And then I look back, I go, gee, that couldn't be more obvious. Or, wow, that sure is a lot of adverbs in one page. You didn't need all those adverbs. You know, like silly stuff that you wouldn't think matters, but that to me matters a lot. Um, the biggest part, though, is I, I'm not someone who plots out a book in detail. Another thing that seems more technical is when I get towards the end, I'll make like a, a, a thing. This is the whole oh, book wow. I just wrote. And it's color coded by character and chapter and, and all like that. 
but I don't have that at the beginning. And I certainly don't have that for the next book, but I do series and the series continue on and I'll get to the next book and I'll say, oh, wow, I should have, I wish I had just given them this ability or, you know, like they, it, there's a, there's a photograph at the end of book one that becomes important in book two. And, and as I'm writing book two, I tell myself, well, James, if you were a smarter person, you would have figured this out before you put the picture in the first book, because now you're stuck with what you just came up with in 10 minutes. And if you'd spent two days on it, you might have more flexibility now. So sometimes that kind of stuff, but what you have to do in life is, and writing and life to me are all in one thing, is you have to be done when you're done and accept the mistakes that you've done. And, and that's the real thing people have writing writer's block and they talk about it. it's really, they are worried about mistakes and they made mistakes. But if you um, just accept I did the best I could and then it's over and now I'm gonna move on and do the next thing. The, the, the problem that we do in life so much is we look back and we, and we try to, and it's like, no, just keep moving on. And you know, if, if some kid calls me someday or sends me an email and says in book one, you said Sydney's favorite pie was blueberry. And in book four, you said Sydney's favorite pie was apple. What's up with that, right? You know, when, when, I, was, uh, when I was 10, I wrote, I, I'm sure this is the only letter like this that this football player ever got. It was a lineman with the Cincinnati Bengals. And first of all, most 10 year olds don't write offensive linemen, right? You write quarterbacks, receivers, running backs. Right? And I, I, I looked at my football cards, my baseball cards, and I wrote to him and I said, on this year's birth, baseball, football card, it says your birthday is blah, blah, blah. On this year's football card, it has a different date. And I wrote like this is this huge mystery and not realizing it's just a mistake. And I go, what's the deal? What's the real birthday? As if I needed to know the real birthday of the second string right <laughs> guard of the Cincinnati Bengals and he sent me back a big picture and an autograph and said my real birthday is this but I'm sure he was sitting there in the <laughs> locker room saying what's with this kid <laughs> comparing birthdays on a card but it's that kid that looks at the birthdays and notices a mistake that writes books about spies and mm -hmm. mysteries with little clues because all my books are based on the one little detail that's wrong is the opening of the unraveling of the bigger mystery. Yeah. And I've never told that story before. I don't know why they came to me, but that, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, can I ask you another question? Yeah, of course. Why do you write uh, books for kids instead of adults? Um, well, I started in Kids TV. I worked at Nickelodeon and Disney mm -hmm. Channel and PBS. So I was already used to writing for kids. But to be honest, and yeah, I think 30% of the people that read the books are adults. I, you know, it's, it's not like a couple. It's like writing for kids is so much better. Kids are so much more interesting. Uh, the problems in the world all come from adults, right? <laughs> the kids are great. I, I, I will meet a 12 year old reader. And well, okay, I'll, I'll put it this way I'll, I'll read a mystery book or I'll watch a mystery movie, even one that I like. And I'll see, oh my goodness, that clue is ridiculously obvious, right? But then uh, grownups just go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, whatever, whatever. I'll run into a 12 year old who has read a book t 10 times. I'll be like, what? Why have you read it 10 times? I read it and I reread it and I reread it. And they won't let me get away with that. And they don't just like the book, they live the book. And it means a lot to them. And if they dislike a part, they hate it. And, you know, like I'll get a note saying, I, I, I love this book, but I hate the ending. So I'm rewriting it and I'll send it to you as soon as I'm done. I want that kind of reader. You know, I want that kind of reader for whom it means a lot. And, and I like, and I take very seriously and all my friends take very seriously that um, kids have limited time. You know, how many books is a kid gonna read in a year? Some might read a bunch. I only read like one in a year at the most. That's valuable, crucial time that I need to take care of. Now that doesn't mean it has to be important and serious in this. But it, it sh if it's supposed to be funny, it should be funny. You know, it should be entertaining. I know that the reader is going through a lot and they've, they've picked up the book because they want to be entertained or they want to be challenged. And we want to model good behavior. And the good behavior that I like to model in a book is caring about people, 
And you can solve so much with your brain. That's why this presentation is so much fun. That, that, that the solutions can come to problems can come from creativity and hard work of thinking like an engineer does. This is a problem. How do I solve it? Not with money, not with influence, not with violence, not with, you know, a hundred people on your side, but with your brain of like, and your heart, that combination of brain and heart. So I care and I'm thinking, we take that incredibly seriously. And I feel like it's an honor that I get to write books for kids. Oh, I think they feel it's an honor too. Yeah, so, um, so I really thank you all. Um, I, I hope you like the book. If you take it home for summer, hopefully it gives you entertainment over the summer. If you don't like it, that's okay. You don't have to write and tell me, but you can. But if you, the important thing is find some books you like. It can be graphic novels, could be comic books, could be biographies, could be wimpy kid, could be whatever. It could be a book that you think is beneath you. Does, there is no, no. Getting lost in a story is a great thing because when we get lost in a story, then we get found in a story. We find ourselves, we find the things that matter to us. And if like me, reading is difficult for you, keep trying. You know, the trick that worked for my son, because I this didn't exist when I was younger. My son struggled with reading in middle school or elementary school. And we ended up doing, we would get him the book or check out the book and check out the audio book. And he would listen to it while he read. And that helped him develop the muscles and the speed of how to become a reader. Just like if you want to be a runner, you don't start off sprinting like Usain Bolt. You learn the mechanic. And he listened while he read for about six months. And then he said, I don't want to listen anymore. And then he went to college and he was an English major. Who would have ever thought that was possible? So um, find the books you love because there are books out there that you will love, that all of them you will love. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, thank you to the Savannah Book Festival for arranging this and getting the books. And thank you for whoever did the grant to buy the books. And I wish you all, I know it's the end of the school year. It's uh, my wife's a school teacher. She's exhausted. I know your teachers and you are all exhausted from this very bizarre year where we all have masks and whatnot. <laughs> um, you've done great to make it through it and your teachers have done great. Make sure to thank them before you go home or send them an email thanking them if you're doing distance learning and here's to a great summer and a better next school year so thank, thank you, you so much it was great to talk to you